And welcome everybody. Holy schnikers, great to have you. In our focus today, we are going to talk about router on a stick. And I had somebody in the comments earlier saying, oh, can't wait, just love me a good router on a stick. So um, what I'm going to do, I think it'd be really effective for us to combine what we've learned in our other sessions together, including some layer two information and how the protocol stack works. And then we can put router on a stick in context. So in that light, let me go ahead and let's take go to the whiteboard. And let's, um, let's imagine we have a user, I don't know, what do you think? What, <laughs> what user should we choose? And if you're saying, Keith, uh, you're probably gonna use Bob, right? You'd be absolutely correct. So let me just uh, organize a little thing here. And let me, let's go ahead and create a user who's gonna be sending some traffic on the network. And then when we get down here to the network layer, we'll focus on exactly what's going on there. So let me get my right tools out and let's go ahead and put Bob here. All right, so Bob is all excited. And the reason that Bob is so excited, he is on his computer, maybe he's opening a browser and gonna go to a website. And this same kind of logic happens whether you're on a uh, mobile device like an iPad or a tablet or an iPhone or an Android device. If you're connected on the network, this logic behind the scenes is what's going on. So Bob logs in or Bob opens up his browser and Bob goes to, let's pick an IP address. Let's say Bob's gonna go to a server at 192.168.1.100. So that's an IP address of a server somewhere. We'll talk about IP addresses here in a moment. So behind the scenes, Bob, Bob's computer, oh my gosh, it's amazing what Bob's computer is gonna do for him. Bob's computer knows that, oh, if he open, puts in a URL or an IP address in his browser, he wants to use, by default, he wants to access a web service. Now, in the TCP IP protocol stack, a popular way or popular protocol to deliver and request that type of service is called HTTP. And that's the application layer in the TCP IP protocol stack. So in the background, Bob's computer formats the correct HTTP, and I'll put this in green to represent the application layer, the correct application layer request. Now, before Bob's computer can send that information on the wire, Bob also, or Bob's computer, I should say, uh, because the computer's doing all the work here, Bob's computer says, oh, it's HTTP. And at the transport layer, Bob's the, the HTTP protocol, the application layer service is using a layer four protocol here. And let me go ahead and get a color that matches that. In fact, I can actually just copy the color. I've got the tools. All right, so at layer four, we're gonna use TCP. Now, there's, there's several different protocols behind the scenes that are used at the transport layer. Um, two popular ones are TCP, which is used by web services. So it's Transmission Control Protocol or TCP. And TCP cares. It cares about making sure we have a good connection. So Bob's computer, if it's using TCP, before it starts making web requests, it's gonna go to the server, hey, how you doing? Are you open for business on web services? And the server's gonna say, yeah. And then Bob's gonna say, great. And that's called a three-way three handshake. It, so TCP does that behind the scenes for us, and then Bob's computer can make the web request. So TCP is added, and in the TCP, well, I've got a question for you. What are the chances that your computer is communicating with more than just one server at a time? And you might say, well, Keith, I've got like five tabs open or 10 tabs open right now. <laughs> and if you do, you have sessions or communications with lots of different devices. And when you're making all those requests in the background, when that data comes back in, your computer needs to know, oh, okay, uh, was this from Google or was this from Twitch or was this from YouTube based on the server you're talking to? And so at the transport layer also, there's information as far as uh, identifiers for which services or which, which service you're using. So the well-known port for HTTP is the port 80. And what that means is, is that in this TCP header, Bob's computer, because he's act trying to reach a server, is gonna use a destination. Think of it like a number. Think of it like a, an identifier. Um, if you had several people in your home and you got a piece of mail, and the mail was mailed to your house, you'd still wanna know what person it's for. And so think of port numbers, logical port numbers in TCP, like identifying the correct person at the house that this message or this, this packet is for. And so it's gonna add on in that TCP header, it's gonna add on the destination port number. So servers, when they're born, a web server says, I should be paying attention to any requests that come in on TCP port 80 because the client's looking for web services. Also, Bob has to use some kind of a source port number. And in order to track that, it's, it's really up to the client computer and it would do something like this. Let's imagine that you and I are Bob's computer. Okay, we're gonna go out to a web server. 
I know that the default TCP port is 80, so we'll send it to that port so the server can say, hey, this is for web services, but I need to have my own source port number so that when the packet, the response comes back, I can put it with the right session. That way, if you're going to Twitch and YouTube and Twitter and other sites, you can have unique source port numbers so that you can keep those responses straight when they come back in. So just out of the blue, let's go ahead and pick a source port of, um, uh, let's see, how about 1545? And you might say, Keith, why that one? Well, the computer gets to choose that. So if we were to look at a protocol analyzer, we would see that there's an HTTP payload, the application layer services HTTP. At layer four, it would be using TCP. It would have a source port that Bob just chose to use going to a well-known port of the server. Now, before Bob's computer can spit that on the network and make it go, Bob also needs to include logical layer three addressing. And let me go ahead and use this tool here to get that color. And it's also going to include a source IP address and a destination IP address. Now, in the case of Bob trying to go to the server, the source IP address, I'm just gonna draw an arrow. It's gonna be Bob's address. It's sort of like this. If you and I were going to mail a letter um, and uh, let's imagine we're sending it to somebody in, uh, and we have the address. We would put the address on the letter. I'll go ahead and do it. So we'd put the destination address on the letter. And also, in the upper left-hand corner, at least up here in the US, in the States, we put a source address. So I'd put source. And Bob's computer is going to do that for IP addressing as well. So it would have, at layer three, it would add the destination's IP address, which is our server at 192.168.1.100. And the source address would be Bob's address, which is, <laughs> looking at it, which is 10.16.0.10. So that information is added at layer three for um, before that packet is sent on the network. So the next, um, you know what I like to do, is I'd like to talk about these IP addresses for just a moment, because I think it's useful and then we'll continue our discussion. Because, um, in fact, let's do this. This will be fun. I've also started Subnet Sunday. No, no, I take it back. It's CCNA Sunday, su Subnet Saturday, and I'm making a playlist. If you want to learn more about IP addresses and subnetting, join me for those live or join me for that playlist. But I wanted to just take a moment and talk about layer three logical IP addresses, the fundamentals. So this is like an abbreviated version from the full live stream we had previously when we introduced IPv4. Okay, so an IP version four layer three address has four numbers. That's it, just four. So these four numbers that go into the IP address, each one of them is gonna be within a range of zero through 255. So if you see an IP version four address and one of the numbers is like 270, <laughs> it's not a valid IPv4 address. So the range, even though we're not gonna use all the IP, all the numbers every time, the range for each of the four numbers is zero through 25. Each of those numbers is separated by a period. All right, so sometimes they call it uh, dotted decimal. The dots are the periods that are separating the three decimal numbers. So here's an example of like the format. Each number is zero through 255 and there are four numbers and they're separated by three periods. And because they're decimal numbers and they're separated by periods, IP version four addresses are often referred to as dotted decimal. So you're saying, Keith, that, uh, well, here's an example. But uh, here's an IP address, 10.193.2.40. Follows all the rules. There's four numbers separated by three periods. Each number is a decimal number between the values of zero and 255. Now, as far as an address, if you and I wanted to write a letter, we would put the destination address on our envelope and we'd put the source address for the return address on the envelope and we'd send it. Now the challenge is with an IPv4 address like this one right here, there's actually two parts in that, only two parts. And those two parts is there's a, a network address, which is a lot like a street name. Um, think of a network address, an IPv4 like a street name. And so there's a street name in this IP address and there's also a host address, which is like a house number. So the trick is uh, identifying which part of this IP address is the street, like the network, and which part is the house. And to do that, to do that identifying of how, you know, which part of an IP address is the network, like a street name, 
and which part is like a host address, like the house number on that street, we have to know where that dividing line is between the two. And that dividing line is called a mask. So if we see an IP address, just look at it and say, wow, uh, that's a beautiful IP address, but I have no idea you know, which part of that is the network and which part is the host, we won't, we won't know unless we have this mask. This mask is the dividing line. It says, hey, everything from this point over is the network. Everything from this point over is the actual host address. So only two parts. If you want a longer version of that, check out the IPv4 fundamentals that's uh, in the playlist already. So the mask is the separating point. So let's take Bob's address. Let's go over here. And here you see Bob's address, 10.16.0.10. My question for you regarding Bob's address is, and I'll bring this here up on a ruler, which part of this address is the street name, like the network ID, the network address, and which part is the actual host? And the answer is, it's all in the mask. So the mask is the dividing line. So if we drew it like, like this, what this would mean is that it's network 10, this part right here, like street 10, like Elm Street, Figueroa Street, Las Vegas Boulevard, that's the actual street name for the network. And then this would be the house number or the host address as they're called in IPv4. And it's the mask with this dividing line that separates the two. That's how we know. All right, one more test. How about, how about this? <laughs> if we did this. Now, what is the street or the network that the computer with this IP address and this mask, what network is it? If you're saying, well, Keith, you told us that the mask separates the network portion over on this side from the host portion over on this side. In this case, this mask is separating it right here. That would mean that the network, like the street name, is 10.16.0, and the actual host address or house address is .10. And you'd be absolutely right. That's how it works. That's the dividing line. All right, we'll cover more about that when we get into uh, subnetting and in that stream as well. But I wanted to give a context for how IP addresses work. Now the challenge is Bob's computer needs to include the source address and destination address inside the packet so that it can be sent and then the, re the server can respond back. So if we look at this, um, as we look at this topology, uh, I think I'd like to do a little whiteboarding to help explain a problem and then you can, and then we can um, work pat through it. Let's do this. And I'm going to draw this out with the appropriate colors here. Let me bring, give myself another layer. And let's imagine we have a room. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Sorry, my bad. One layer up. There we go. And I want to control ZZ. And almost there. There we go. All right, so let's imagine that we have a room. And in that room, let's call this room VLAN. 10. <laughs> How about that? So from our other, other discussions, a VLAN is nothing more than a layer two broadcast domain, like Vegas. Like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. If there's a broadcast in a VLAN, it stays in that VLAN. And what we learned about trunking is that a VLAN could exist, like VLAN 10, could exist on two or three or more switches. But at the end of the day, all the ports in VLAN 10 are part of one giant layer two broadcast domain, one big VLAN. But associated with each VLAN, and this is the part that a lot of people early on need to correlate is that with every VLAN, at, which is a layer two thing, there's also a street name at layer three. And we call these streets network addresses. And so we're going to associate a network address or like a street name with every VLAN. So if we have 10 VLANs, we're going to likely have 10 separate IP address, IP network addresses or street names, one for each of those VLANs. So if we go back to our whiteboard, VLAN 10, Let's go ahead and use the network of 10.16.0.0 and the mask. I'm going to draw the mask in red here. Let's say the mask is the cutting off line right there, <laughs> which means everything to the left is the network and everything to the right is the actual host addresses. And let me go get back and get white. All right. And so we have some PCs here. So if we have a PC, let's say PC1 and say PC3, these computers if they're in VLAN 10 and we're using this IP addressing space at layer three, each of those are going to have their first three numbers the same as that 10.16.0 dot something. So if PC1 is dot 10 and PC, uh, let's see, it's PC3, and PC3 is dot 30 in the same VLAN, they can talk to each other. 
No problem. It would go something, uh, well, it would go something like this. <laughs> PC1, if you did a ping, P-I-N-G, which is just a, a way to test basic connectivity. If PC1 types ping 10.16.0.30, it would say, okay, great. This is on the same network because the first three numbers of PC1, which is 10.16.0, and the first three numbers for PC3 is 10.16.0. The, the, the PC says, hey, this is on the same VLAN, same IP address, same local network. And as a result, if it needs the layer two address, which it would on Ethernet, it'll ARP for it. So PC1 says, hey, Mr. PC3, sends a broadcast for an ARP request. I need your layer two address. And PC3 says, oh yeah, here's my layer two address. And then they can forward frames back and forth and they're switched back and forth at layer two between those two devices. And that's because they're on the same VLAN. But it gets a little dicier and more fun if we do something like this. Let's imagine we have another room, another VLAN, and we'll make this one VLAN 20. And in VLAN 20, we're going to be using a different network address space. So each layer 2 VLAN has an associated layer 3 network address. And this is... <laughs> the question is, who makes this stuff up or who plans on it? The network engineer. So if you're building or designing a network, it's the network engineer that plans on what street names are going to be associated with what VLANs. So it's not just by accident, it's by somebody at some point, either through automation or through design, planning on what those network addresses are going to be. So for VLAN 20, since uh, we have the choice here, I'm going to use 172.16.0.0. And the dividing line, the mask, which is dividing the network from the host portion, is going to be right here. And so, that would also be represented as a slash 24-bit mask. And we'll take a closer look at that in our subnetting Saturday sessions where you'll become quite familiar and comfortable with why slash 24 means that these first three numbers are the network and the last number is the actual host address. So then on this network, VLAN 20, let's imagine we have a couple more devices, PC2 and PC4. And so their first three numbers, because everybody in VLAN 20 it's going to have the first three numbers matching 172.16.0. That's, that's like the street name. We, we can't live on Elm Street and have an address on Figueroa Street. So if we live on Elm Street, we have to have Elm Street as part of our address. And the same thing for computer networks. Everybody in the same VLAN is going to have the same IP network portion as part of their IP address. It's like the street name. And then their host or house ID identifiers will be unique. So on VLAN 20, Maybe PC2 is 172.16.0 dot, let's say 20 for its last number. And maybe PC4 is dot 40. Okay. And then that's all, that, that same logic goes on and on and on. Same thing. So if this is VLAN 777 and we have, um, let's go ahead and put a network of 192 just to mix it up. 192.168.1.0. And the dividing line is also there. Now the dividing line, is controlled by the mask and we can we can specify wherever we want that to be as a network engineer but for now it's going to be right there and we'll say that's also a slash 24 bit mask which it is and then if we have a server on this vlan so srvr and maybe his ip address is dot 100. so the key is with vlans every vlan is going to have associated with it a logical layer 3 network address think of it like every vlan is going to have a street name except these street names have to be have or happen to be in ip version 4 a set of numbers maybe it's the first number or the first two numbers or the first three numbers it's controlled by the mask and the person who designed the network but every layer 2 vlan is going to have an associated layer 3 network address so if you and i are computers and we're in the same vlan um, and we know each other's IP addresses, we can communicate with each other, we can dynamically with ARP learn each other's layer two addresses and have a great time. Life is good, wonderful. Same VLAN, no problem. The problem is if we have devices in one VLAN <laughs> that have a need or desire to communicate with a device in a different VLAN. So it's like from one network to the other. And let me give you an example here. I think I have, I think I have a good example of that really close. Let's see here. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. I thought I did. Hold on one second. Okay, there's one. Let's see if I can find the server. I know I made them. Hold on one second, this will be totally worth it. I'm looking for a server's IP address. Don't make me make a new one, because I will. 
Oh, right, there it is. Got it. Okay. All right. So um, let's imagine that uh, that's our IP address. So if we go back to the diagram here, this is PC1's IP address in VLAN 10, 10.16.0.10. So that's its IP address. Also, the computer knows what its mask is because it's configured with the IP address on every device, every host. So from a mask perspective, the mask says something like this. I get to line it up here. Based on the mask, the computer says, oh, my network is the 10.16.0 network, everything from the dividing line this way, and my host address is .10. So if you ask this computer, if you walked up to PC1 and said, What's your ne what network are you on? If it could speak English, <laughs> it would say, I'm on network 10.16.0. That's my street name. That's my network ID. That's my the network I live on. And he'd be right. So that in mind, if this computer who believes his network address is 10.16.0 is trying to forward data to the server. Oh my gosh, line that up. There we go. So the top one is our IP address of PC1. And if it wants to send a packet of data to the server at 192.168.1.100, is the client going to think, hey, that device that I'm trying to reach is on my same network. Or is it going to say, whoa, I think my network is 10.16.0 and I need to send a packet to 192.168.1. Well, at least, at least the first three octets are different. The first three numbers are different. That's the PC's job to identify same network or different network. And if the network is a different network, the route, the, uh, the PC says, um, I need help. I get by with a little help from my friends. And to get off your street, if you ever, if a device needs to forward data off of its local IP network, which also means off of its local VLAN associated with that network, it's going to need help from a router because routers can take packets, look at the layer three information, and then make a forwarding decision or a routing decision based on what they see on what, how they know how to forward packets. So in the case of a device on the 10.16.0 network, trying to forward a packet to 192.168.1, anything, it's going to, PC1 is going to forward the frame at layer two to its default gateway, which is also configured on most devices. So to get off of a local VLAN, to get off of a local subnet, it requires a router. So let's uh, let's draw in a router. I'm going to bring another layer here, and let's draw in a router. So here's one way of doing it. So we'll draw the symbol for a router, something like that. If it's Cisco, it'd be a nice, cool kind of green color. <laughs> And we'll call that router one. And so with router one, what we could do is we could basically plug them into each VLAN. So we could take interface one slash one, two slash two, three slash three, and plug them into a port, an access port on VLAN 10. We could plug two, two into an access port assigned to VLAN 20 on these switches. And three slash three, we could plug them into an access port on VLAN 777. And then what we would do is on these interfaces, we'd bring them up with the no shutdown command, very important. And, and we would go ahead and assign these interfaces IP addresses. So on this interface one slash one, if it's connected to VLAN 10 on this access port assigned to VLAN 10, we could give it the IP address of 10.16.0. And it has to be that subnet because that's the network or that network because that's the network that VLAN 10 is supporting. So we put this IP address 10.16.0 dot and let's just choose dot one. And we can assign the fact that these first three network our numbers are the network, and this is the actual host identifier at the end. Now, now did we have to use dot one? I mean, did we really have to do that? The answer is no. We don't have to use dot one. It's again up to the network designer who planned it. So, if we're going to use dot one for this interface, we would then train all the clients in VLAN 10 that hey, uh, if you ever need to forward packets outside of your local network 10.16.0 you can use the default gateway at 10.16.0. And in our case, we're going to use dot one. And as a result, whenever those computers need to forward a packet, they'll look at their own IP address. They'll look at their own network portion. They'll look at the destination they're going to. And if the destination networks look looks different than their local network, they say, yep, I need to use my default gateway. And then at layer two, they'll forward the frame to the layer two address of their default gateway who will then receive it, say, wow, I know how to get there, make a routing decision, and forward the packet in the correct, hopefully in the right direction.
and that's how it works. So that's a uh, that's how inter VLAN routing can work. So on this interface here, the IP address could be 172.16.0. We don't have a choice about that because it's on this network, and we could give it an address of .1. And on the VLAN 777, we could go ahead and do 192.168.1.m. Let's mix it up. Let's use .5. And that would work. No problem there, as long as we train all the clients who are on this network, 192.168.1, train them that their default gateway is .5. And if they know their default gateway is .5, they know how to reach them if they need to forward a packet off the network. And that is the, the option or the method we have for inter-VLAN routing. Okay, so a couple of problems with that. <laughs> Actually, there's a few problems with that. Individual ports, uh, this is a switch, the one below it is a router. Individual ports on a router uh, cost money. And what if we have 40 VLANs? Uh, are we going to have 40 separate physical interfaces from a router going to each and every, uh, each and every VLAN? That's, that doesn't seem like it would make sense. So instead of doing that, we can use the same exact logic, except we can use one physical interface for all of the routing. Let me show you how that might work. Let me clear off this layer like that. That was conveniently all tucked away all by itself. Let me add another layer. And instead of using three separate interfaces, let's go ahead and do this. A three separate physical interfaces. Here's our router. And what we'll do is um, we'll just treat all of this as a switched environment. So this could be two or three switches with trunking between them. It could be 10, 15 switches. It doesn't matter too much. Um, but the fact is that we could have ports in VLAN 10 on any of those switches. And based on our previous discussions of how VLANs are supported and trunking works, it doesn't matter really which switch we connect to. We can have any of, any of these switches in a switched environment with trunks in between them can support any VLAN as an access port. So what we do is we take this block of switches and we take R1, let's take gig 0 slash 0, and we plug into a port on a switch, any one of these switches for that matter. And what we do is we configure this interface as a trunk. And if you're saying, or if you're thinking, wait, 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 we covered trunking in a separate video. You mean we get to recycle or reuse that information? The answer is, yeah. <laughs> So what we could do is on the switch, we could trunk, which allows us to carry all the VLAN traffic and tag it with 802.1Q before we send it over to the router. So on the switch part, we'll just trunk all possible VLANs that we want to support with inter-VLAN routing. We'll trunk all those over to a router. And then on the router, here's what we'll do. On the router, we'll bring up this interface, which is really important. <laughs> so we'll bring a, do a no shut there. And then what we'll do is we will create three logical sub-interfaces. Now, I want to express to you the cost of a sub-interface. It's free. <laughs> it doesn't cost any additional money. You take one physical interface and then you create these logical sub-interfaces. They're just virtual interfaces to support each of the VLANs. So if we have three VLANs like we have here, we can create three sub-interfaces, one for each VLAN. If we had 40 VLANs, we could create 40 sub-interfaces, one for each of the VLANs. So to do that, We'll go ahead and let's say we want to create, we're going to do a gig zero slash zero dot, and then we can specify a number. Now, it could be like 1, 17, 6, 7, 92. But a lot of times when we create these sub interfaces, we'll create them and match the VLAN number. You don't have to, not required. But holy, I mean, when you're looking at all these sub interfaces and you're thinking, where does that one go? Or what IP, what IP address do I use here again? Sometimes it's easier if you build in the logic and have the sub interface as the same name as the VLAN. So for gig zero, for VLAN 10, we could do gig 00.10. For VLAN 20, we could do gig 00 slash 20. And for VLAN 777, we could make gig 0 slash 0.777. So we create these logical sub interfaces, and then we use a command called encapsulation. I'll show you that in a moment. Encapsulation.1Q, encapsulation and then we specify the VLAN it's supporting. So this would be encapsulation.1Q10. On this one, it would be encapsulation.1Q20. And on this one, it would be encapsulation.1Q777. Now, the reason, now here's how that works. 
if somebody, when, when those frames from the switch go into the router um, and they're tagged because we're using 802.1Q, if the tag for the VLAN tag, if the VLAN tag is 10, logically that frame is then processed and sent to logically the sub interface that's supporting VLAN 10. If the frame comes in from the switch and it's tagged as 20, logically at the router, when it receives that, it opens it up, says, oh, the tag is 20, and it logically processes that on its VLAN, on the, on the sub interface that's supporting VLAN 20. Same thing for 777. So it's just a, uh, it's like a Harry Potter sorting hat. <laughs> frame comes in, we look at the tag, and then we assign, we have the logical sub interface that matches that tag with the encapsulation command, support that, inter support that, uh, that frame that came in. And then we have assigned IP addresses. So for gig 00 slash 10, we'd assign an IP address from the 10 subnet. Maybe we give it dot one there. From the 20 subnet, we maybe give it a dot one there. So 172.16.0.1. And then for the dot 777 subinterface, we could assign the IP address of dot five. Again, based on a plan of what we want the default gateways to be. And then we train the clients. Everybody in VLAN 10, if you have a packet and it needs to go to someone who's outside your local subnet, Go ahead, or local network, synonymous. Um, go ahead and forward it to your default gateways layer two address, and then he'll receive it, and then he'll continue to go ahead and route it. So that's how that works. And if we were to do this, let me go ahead and hide that, and hide that, and hide that. All right. So back to this discussion, we've just described how this router right here, which is our going to be our router on a stick. Let me bring up one more layer. We've just identified how we could have this router by trunking here and creating sub-interfaces. This is gig zero slash zero. We could create sub-interfaces to support VLAN 10 and the 1016 network and VLAN 20 and the 172216 network and VLAN 777 and the 192.168.1 network. And that's how we do it by simply creating trunking here and creating logical sub-interfaces to support each one of those. All right, so um, I do want to reinforce one more thing before I demo this, and that is this. Let me bring up another color here. If the client PC right here um, needs to send a packet to, let me bring up the server. Um, let's say we have a server out here at one, oh, I need to get my color going on. Uh, Actually, this is right off this port is VLAN 777. And there's an host, a server at 192.168.1.100 right there. So this is an access port for VLAN 777 and there's a server right here. So if Bob wanted to go ahead and open up a web request to that server, he'd open his browser, put in the IP address 192.168.1.100. Behind the scenes, he'd be using HTTP. Also, behind the scenes, be using TCP. There'd be a source port that Bob would use to track that, and a destination port, which is the well-known port for HTTP. Bob, for the source source IP address, would have his IP address 10.16.0.10. The destination IP address would be 172.16.0.40. Oh, stop that! the The destination address would be the server. I was like. <laughs> Keith, you had me. We were going to the server, and then you changed the destination. No, he's going to the server at 192.168.1.100. So that would be the destination IP address. That would be in the IP header. But now, because Bob is in VLAN 10, and he is in the 10.16.0 network, and he's trying to reach 192.168.1 something, which is not the same as his local network, at layer 2, this is where he's going to add the layer 2 address. I'm going to put this in black so we can read it. Uh, the source layer two address, which is gonna be Bob's computer right there. And the destination layer two address here at layer two is going to be Bob's default gateway. And that's because Bob saw, hey, the source address, my, my, my address, my network I'm on is different than where I'm trying to reach. And so at layer two, he's gonna put the layer two address of his default gateway, which in this case is gonna be 190 which is going to be 10.16.0.1 once we configure this router as a router on a stick. And then when router one receives it, he'll look at the destination layer two address of this, and he will also be directly connected to the 192.168.1 network on a different interface. And so he'll make a layer three routing decision based on that IP information, forward the packet in the direction of the server. So that, 
That's a lot of cool stuff. Um, I wanted to break it down. I wanted to make sure that we understood the bigger picture of how it works. And I was just say, yeah, right around stick, here's the commands. But now it's time to actually test it. So what we'll do is we'll go to router one and it's not configured at all. <laughs> and uh, we'll configure, in fact, let's point to this while we do it. We'll configure three slash two on switch one to act as a trunk. We'll configure R1 gig zero zero to bring it up and we'll create three logical sub interfaces and tell each of those sub interfaces they're supporting, they're supporting VLANs 10, 20, and 777. And then we'll assign IP addresses respectively to those three interfaces of dot one, dot one, and dot five on those specific subnets. So let me bring up, let me see if my lab is still with me. All right, come on, Mr. Lab. And I need to log in, all right. Let me make sure I have connectivity everywhere. Okay, so let's start at the switch. Um, on the switch, if we do a show CDP neighbor, I just wanna make sure we have the right port. We need to configure the interface that goes out to router one. And I do not see it here. And I think I know why. If we look back at our drawing, gig zero zero on this router is not up yet. And as a result, <laughs> you're not sending any frames, no CDP messages, anything, unless your interface is up. So we will configure the trunk port here on three slash two, and then we'll go ahead and bring up R1's gig zero zero. But that is the correct port. Three slash two is where we need to uh, do the trunking. So we'll go into configuration mode, interface gig, what did I say, three slash two, fantastic. And we'll do a switch. Actually, you know, there's one other thing too. In this lab environment, I need to um, I need to say no auto or no negotiation auto because it's emulated uh, full duplex isn't really full duplex. So I need to hard code that. I'm gonna say don't negotiate speed and duplex auto. Go ahead and do duplex full. And that's only because I don't want to get a CDP message <laughs> that says, hey, your duplex is off with the router on the other side. So um, that's just a preparatory step. All right, now on interface gig three slash two, if you have participated with me in the trunking section, I'd like to have you think, or if you already know this, what are the commands? What are the commands that we would use to implement uh, the encapsulation of dot one Q for trunking and then force it to be a trunk? So I'll go ahead and put those commands in. And if you knew it, great, if you don't, uh, I encourage you to come back and check out the um, the video on dot one Q and trunking. So the command is switch port trunk encapsulation dot one Q. And that says, if you have other flavors of trunking, don't use them, go ahead and use dot one Q. And in the old days that we had ISL that was supported a long time ago, but that forces that mode. And then we'll go ahead and do a switch port mode trunk. And that simply says, I want to be a trunk and we're going to use 802.1Q. And that's it. Now, because the other side of the link, um, and over here, because gig zero zero isn't up yet, we're not gonna have a successful trunk until we get link from the other side. So let's go configure R1. We'll bring up gig zero zero. We'll create three sub interfaces. We'll give them the correct IP addresses, and then we'll test it. All right, so back at our interface, we'll uh, go to the right device, which is R1. I will uh, do as I teach here. We're gonna verify what our current state is, so important. Just to verify what you think is in place is in place. This helps also to confirm you're on the right device because in large networks and working with the cloud, uh, we are not gonna be at the console a lot for devices. We are working with devices that are my hundreds or thousands of miles away sometimes. So it's important to just do some visual, visual cues to make sure they're on the right device. Okay, so we are on the right device and we'll go into configuration mode, interface gig zero slash zero. And we'll do the command no shutdown to bring it up. All right, so we'll get a message there in a moment that it's up. And it's, uh, I'm gonna, we don't have to type in exit to do this next command, but I do want to do it so we get context sensitive help. We are gonna create three sub interfaces logically underneath the parent interface of gig zero zero. To do that, we'll say interface gig zero slash zero and check this out. I'm gonna do a question mark. <laughs> See this dot right there? That's our option, it's wonderful. So basically that dot says, you can place a dot there and then a question mark and then a number, somewhere between four and I don't know, that's a lot right there, that's a lot of numbers. Anyway, we're gonna use the sub interface number of 10. So boom, we've just created this logical sub interface called interface gig zero slash zero dot 10. Next, we're gonna specify which VLAN 
it's supporting which dot one q tags when they come into this router on this interface from the switch uh, what sub interface what vlan do we want to pay attention to so the syntax for that is encapsulation <laughs> dot one q because that's what we're doing on the switch and then the next option is the vlan that we're supporting and we are supporting vlan 10. so it's this command right here that says pay attention for incoming frames on that parent interface that have a dot one q tag of 10 logically hand them over to this sub interface for processing. So on the sub interface, we're also going to give it an IP address. So IP address, and let's take a look at our topology just to make sure we're going to get the right one. So this is going to support VLAN 10. And so the IP address we're going to assign is right here, 10.16.0. And we'll use dot one. Again, this will be planned out ahead of time. And 10.16.0.1. And we're going to tell this router that this interface is using the first three numbers as the network by using a 24-bit mask. For more details on the mask, stay tuned for Subnet Saturdays in that playlist. We're gonna go over all of that in detail, including getting into custom subnetting. All right, so that is done. So if we type in a do show IP interface brief, check this out, this is so fun. Check that. Here is the sub interface right there. The logical sub interface, 0 slash 0 dot 10 with that IP address. And also if we did a show directly on the interface for IP, it would show us the mask as well. All right, two more to go. So we'll go ahead and type in interface gig 0 slash 0. And let's create the sub interface supporting VLAN 20. Encapsulation dot 1Q for VLAN 20. And the IP address of, and taking a look at our notes, is going to be IP address uh, right here, 172.16.0 is the network and we're gonna use dot one again for the IP network address associated with the layer two VLAN of 20. So let's do that. IP address 172.16.0.1 with a 24 bit mask, which in English simply means the first three numbers of the network and the last number of the IP address is the host ID, like the house number and we're two down and one to go. So interface gig zero slash zero dot seven 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 to support our last VLAN and encapsulation dot one Q for VLAN seven 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 and then an IP address of one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot one dot <laughs> hey, okay let me let me share with you my uh, my hesitation here. Um, the server I have in VLAN seven 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 that has the IP address of one ninety two one sixty eight one dot one hundred I believe it's default gateway, or at least it's routing it's using to get to other networks is dot five. And that's the only reason I'm using dot five as the default gateway address on the sub interface to is so I can support that device and other devices that are gonna use dot five as their default gateway. <laughs> we'll be able to test that here in just a few moments. So we'll make it dot five and a 24 bit mask, meaning the first three numbers of the IP address are the network, like street 192.168.1, and a host address of dot five. That's what the mask is saying with that mask. And let's do a show IP interface brief. And verify our work. All right, so we have the subinterface of dot 10 supporting VLAN 10. We have a subinterface of dot 20, which behind the scenes with the encapsulation command is supporting VLAN 20. And a subinterface 777 supporting VLAN 777. For and, and the IP address of 192.168.1.5. We can also do this. This is kind of a wacky command, but it works. Show VLANs. <laughs> um, even though it's a router, um, it's going to show us the details on the VLANs it's supporting. So VLAN 1, that's a freebie. Um, that's the Banger interface. But we have VLAN 10, which is being supported by subinterface gig 00 0.10. And we have support for VLAN 20 and also support for VLAN 777. Oh, there it is, there's 20. I don't know why I didn't put it in numerical order, but anyway, um, there we go. So we have all those interfaces supported, all those subnets supported, and now, and now it's time to test it. Uh, what are some commands that we should be doing? Uh, maybe a show IP route, just to make sure that this router has routes and is directly connected logically to all three networks, that would be good. So we'll do a show IP route, and let me go ahead and remove the local connected. I'm gonna say pipe exclude and capital L. All that it says is show me IP, show IP route. And by the way, if there's a row that has a capital L in it, don't bother showing it. So here's our routes based on our directly connected networks. So we have a route for the 1016 network, 
a route for the 172.16 network and a route for the 192.168.1 network using those three sub interfaces. So if we brought up a client, which let's do it. Uh, let's bring up uh, Bob's PC. I've got him right here in my lap. So let's bring up Bob's client and let's bring up Chrome. And as excited as I am about that, let's go ahead and bring up a command prompt too. So I'm gonna bring up a command prompt in various versions of Windows. It may be PowerShell, a CLI, a command line interface is a command line interface. Either way will work. Let's do an IP config. And the command IP config says that our IP address is 1016.0.10 and our default gateway is 1016.0.1, which is convenient because we just set up R1 with the sub interface of 1016.0.1. So if we were to do a trace, so trace RT is how we spell it in Windows, and we'll do a dash D for don't bother doing name resolution. Don't try to figure out the name behind each hop, each IP address. And then we'll put in 192.168.1.100. When we do a trace from Windows, it's actually behind the scenes using ICMP. Uh, so from the client, from the destination, it looks like just a ping request at the end of the day, and then they respond. But because it messes with the TTL, it can show us each and every hop in the path between this PC and that server. So oh, I, <laughs> I have to admit, I was, I was wondering if it was going to work. So it's working, and it's showing that the first hop was 10.16.01. That's our default gateway. That's R1 sub-interface. And then the second hop was the server itself. And that's because router one is directly connected to both networks. And it just looked at the IP header, made a forwarding decision, and sent it on its way. So if we were to gander at this, let me go ahead and bring this over. That'll work. All right, let me bring out a, another pen tool so I can write on the top of this. Okay, fantastic. So if we were to take a look, uh, did, we, did we open up, you know, let's do one, one other thing too. Uh, let's open up a web page and make sure we can actually reach the server. We'll do a full home run there. So let me minimize that and let's open a browser and go to 192.168.1.0, So in the background, this PC, because its IP address is 10.16.0.10, it knows that this destination is on a different network so Bob's computer, when we press enter, is formulating the HTTP request on Bob's behalf. It's including the TCP port information, including a source port for Bob and destination port. It's included, that's layer four. At layer five, <laughs> oh my gosh, not enough sleep. So it's including the source and destination ports. At layer three, it's including the source and destination IP addresses, which would be the source IP address of Bob and the destination address of the server. And then at layer two, it would have its own source MAC address. And because it, the, it, we need to forward this to a non-local device, IP-wise, the layer two address would be the layer two address of router one, our default gateway. So if, PC, if the PC didn't know what that layer two address was for its default gateway, it would ARP for it, find out. And then at layer two, it would include that layer two address and then spit them on the network, at which point R1 would receive that it would have a tag from the switch saying, hey, this is from VLAN 10 because that's where this client PC is. And it would process it logically on its sub-interface for VLAN 10. It'd make a routing decision and then it would route it out the VLAN 777 sub-interface so it could forward it on its way to the actual server. So I thought it would be fun to actually take a look at that actually happening. So let's bring up, <laughs> I really want to show you this protocol capture. I'm so excited, uh, but I want to show you happening first. And so let's go to our lab and let's press enter here. Boom. There we go. So we have connectivity we verified here and we also have effectively, we've got a web page from that server. And now, now <laughs> let me show you the uh, a packet capture I did about an hour ago in preparation for this session today. And here it is. So if we take a look at the application layer, and I'm going to color code this appropriately. Let me remove that. And this represents the application layer So of the protocol stack. So this is inverted. So it's going to be application layer shown here. And then we have at layer four, we've got TCP, which let me remember my color for that. Hold on one second. And up you go, there you go. And my color for that is, uh, okay, like an orange color, fair enough. So let me go back to this. 
lots of windows open. All right. So we'll go to a oranges color for that. So at the, oh, I moved it. All right, let me, um, let me move it back down. All right. And you know what I can do? I'm just gonna clear that and I'll do it again. There we go. All right, so here's the application layer. And then we have the TCP right here, which I will go ahead and put in the appropriate color, which I believe is sort of like this. So the transmission control protocol, Bob chose to use source port 1545. His computer did that for him in the background and Bob sent, used the destination port as port 80. That way, when the server receives it, it opens it all up, looks at port 80 and says, oh, you want web services. And then it goes ahead and responds back to Bob, back to Bob's source port. And that's how Bob can keep those sessions straight. Then at layer three, which I believe we're using blue for, we have the IP protocol. So we have the source and destination IP addresses that were added. So there's the source IP address of 10.16.0.10. That's Bob's computer. And the destination IP address is 192.168.1.100, which is the server. And then we have this tag. So this tag got added, injected, because I captured this packet um, as it came in from the switch over to the router. So because it was coming from the client in VLAN 10, it had a tag of 10. So that's, that is right there. And then at layer two, if we go to a layer two type of color here, I'm gonna just go ahead and use, um, use something we can read. At layer two, it's gonna have the source MAC address of Bob's computer, which is ending in 778899, and the destination address of the default gateway, which is ending in BC0008. And uh, you know, it'd be really cool if we could actually verify those addresses. So this is literally, literally what would be captured on the wire on the network based on Bob making an HTTP request, assuming he used that source port and those are the MAC addresses involved. So I say we do it. Uh, we have the technology here. Let me go ahead and bring up our lab environment. And on router one, if we do a show interface for gig zero slash zero dot, and that came in on VLAN 10, so dot 10, check this out. <laughs> There's interface gig 00.10. Here is the layer two address of that bad boy ending in BC.0008. So that was the destination layer two address that Bob's client used. And uh, here's the IP address. This, so this is the layer two address of that sub interface. And here is the layer three address. 10.16.0 is the network and dot one is the host address. And it is using 802.1Q encapsulation and it's supporting VLAN 10 based on our configuration. You know what, that was so fun to put together. I had a lot, I, get, I can't tell you, I had a lot of fun in putting that together <laughs> earlier today. So, um, focus here was router on a stick and we threw in some other pieces to get a bigger picture of how that all works. The router on the stick part, it boils down to a few basic things. Number one, if we don't wanna use separate physical interfaces to support 10 VLANs, we can use one on an external router. To do that on the switch, we had set the switch port that's connecting the router. And that's why they call it router on a stick, by the way, if you look at it, kind of looks like a lollipop right here. See how it's just like, like one connection and then this round thing. That's why they call it router on a stick. We have one physical connection, but we can support multiple sub interfaces. Uh, so it kind of looks like uh, a router on a stick, in this case, sideways to the left. <laughs> So um, we take one physical router or one port on a router and we connect it to a switch port that's trunking to us to support all the VLANs. And then on the router, we bring up the parent interface, like gig00 in our case. We create sub interfaces, one for each VLAN. We specify for each of those sub interfaces that we're using dot one Q encapsulation. We specify specifically what the VLAN we're supporting for that sub interface. And then we give it an IP address based on our network design that the devices in that VLAN can use as their default gateway. And then we bring it up and test it and it works and ta-da, router on a stick. So um, I had a lot of fun putting this together. Uh, I wanna remind you about two things, uh, maybe three before we finish. Number one, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to go to the playlist. I've got a couple running now, one for CCNA and I got another one that's just gonna be for subnetting. So um, that way you can easily go to the parts that are most interesting to you. Uh, those playlists are growing. I add new videos to them weekly. So if you need to catch up or if you have questions like, wait, hey, what's trunking or how does that work? Um, I would encourage you to start from the beginning and just go through and grab a friend. Uh, studying is always better together. 
when I was getting my first CCIE back in 2001, a long time ago, um, my study buddy was Ed Dinez. And boy, he I am, I am CCIE 6783, and he is CCIE 6784, and I, I owe it to him for sticking with it. Because near the end, I was not, I was tired. I was tired of studying. I studied like eight months, uh, four days a week, uh, I think three to four hours a night. And uh, I was able, and Ed Dinez near the end, here's a quick story. And I also have a full CCA story on YouTube if you want to watch it. But the, uh, the crux was, is like two weeks away. And I was chatting with Ed and I said, I'm just so tired of studying. I was, I was, I felt I've earned this. I've worked hard enough. And Ed said, you know, have you tried um, uh, voice over IP? Because that's on the blueprint back in 2001. So were a lot of other things like uh, token ring switching and uh, um, data link switching and a lot of other, and ATM, <laughs> which we don't use a lot of that anymore. Anyway, um, so he said, have you tried voice over IP? Have you tested that? I go, no, I, I saw the commands. Hey, I saw them, I'm good. He goes, no, you got to try it out. And uh, he encouraged me. I did. And that, I had a nightmare uh, situation in my lap. It was just the worst ever. Um, and uh, But that one extra ounce of push that Ed Dinez gave me, I thank him to this day for helping me get my CCIE on that first attempt because I was down to the wire and I had to configure PLAR, private, private line automatic ring down. So effectively, you had a, a phone that was connected to a port on a, on a router and another phone on a different router. And if you picked up one phone, it would automatically make the other one ring. And just f like maybe moments before we were done on the first day, this is back when we had two-day labs, uh, a lab that was two days. Moments before I was just like slamming it in the config, not even checking. I, I was doing my best I could, did my saves. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna pick up that phone. And the proctor, Kathy, was right there. I picked up that phone. And the other one rang, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have a, ch I have a chance. And then you go home that night, and um, not home, you go to the apart the hotel that night, and then the next day when you come in, they let you know uh, whether or not you get to continue when you come in. So uh, the way they let you know is you come in, and you sit down at your desk, and if there's a binder there, that means you qualify. You have enough points from the first day to continue on with the second day. So I, I came in all hopeful, sat down, no book, no binder. It's like, oh man. And then, oh, it's like it's yesterday. Uh, then to my left, somebody came up and tapped me on the shoulder and I looked up and he goes, dude, you're in my seat. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And um, that was back in 2001, January, I think of 2001. So if that was you, I, I'm sorry you didn't pass that day. But I was like, oh my gosh. And they were, we were seated alphabetically. So I was near the front, but I wasn't you know, so focused on loud. I, was, I missed my seat. So I was one row B. I, my seat was one ahead. So I, I, there was a book up there, sat down. And then the second day, I was just so grateful. I was just going at multicast and um, a lot of other cool stuff that we had that second day, troubleshooting. So a lot of fun. Um, in any event, oh, getting back to studying. If you haven't already, <laughs> Make a commitment if you're going for CCNA or you just want to brush up on your CCNA level skills, which are core to moving on to professional and IE level as well. Um, get a study buddy. Get somebody who can help keep you accountable, motivated. Um, I'm always there to cheer you on if you want to grab on, get me on social and say I'm committed to a certain test by a certain date or I'm committed to studying 15 minutes uh, a day or a few hours a week or whatever it is. Commit. Commit. That's going to help. And then get a study buddy to help you study. That way you can talk back and forth. You can encourage each other. And, uh, and move forward. Secondly, um, I would encourage you to invite, a, right, invite that friend to subscribe and hit the alert bell so you are alerted when there's new videos. And if you miss a week, not that big deal um, because I'll have the playlist that I'll just keep on adding to the playlist to make it easy, really easy to find. And the third is um, besides having fun, which it is, it's, you know, today when I do a, um, uh, like a ping, like even today when I did that, <laughs> when I did a trace route or a ping or brought up the web page and it worked, I was like, yes. I still have that excitement about, yeah, it's working. And all of these things that we are studying together and learning together are gonna to make us better and better at both designing networks and also troubleshooting networks. And these are protocols that are used every day, thousands and thousands of time, whether you're doing VR uh, or you're playing online games or you're you know connecting over the web for news or, or whatever it is, we're using all these protocols in the background and the frames are happening millions of times per minute. There's just, well, if you're on a, if you, if you have internet connectivity at uh, 10 megabytes per second or megabits per second, that's a, that's a lot of traffic or 100 megabits or 300 megabits. There's just a lot of traffic possible happening. So it'll make you more effective at that. All right, what else did I want to mention? 
Got a little sidetracked there. Um, get a study buddy. Subscribe. Hit the alert bell. Go through the playlist. Make sure you're comfortable. Teach what you know to others. Enjoy the journey. Oh, yeah, here it is. I was like circling until I thought of my last thing. Get hands-on practice, please. Because I'll tell you what, as I'm going through some of these topics, which I haven't done in a while, um, I get it, they come back really, really fast because I have I did them so many times early on. I had hands-on practice. So the more we practice, like that command, show VLANs, I, I set up earlier today, I practiced the lab. I want it to work. So I, I labbed it up once and said, okay, got it. And I was like, what's that command <laughs> where you can see the sub interfaces and the VLANs they support all on like one page. And I think, I think it's show VLAN. I typed in show VLAN. Where I? No, it's going to show VLAN something. I did show VLANs and, and it was there. And I thought, yeah, there it is. So the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. And a packet tracer, boy, if somebody is just on YouTube and they've got this channel as a starting point, and they want to get Packet Tracer, you can sign up for free through netacad.com. Get Packet Tracer. It is more than wonderful uh, on in just doing everything that I've, I think everything that I've shown so far in all of these live streams and all these playlists, you can do with Packet Tracer. Dynamic ARP inspection, uh, port security, trunking, VLANs, OSPF, Ether, Ether channel, I, I haven't tried Ether Channel on Packet Tracer, but I bet you it works. So it's amazing. So I would encourage you, if you want a hands-on practice, and, and I would encourage you ha to have a hands-on practice, get Packet Tracer. If you want to buy some used gear, that's fine too. Uh, we have labs at CBT Nuggets as well as part of that training, if that's of interest to you. But the hands-on practice, whether it's you know free through Packet Tracer, that's the, that's the shortest barrier between a person who wants to get hands-on practice and getting it. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to buy anything and you can do all the practice. And I think I'm gonna have at least one, um, either a CSNA Sunday or a Wednesday afternoon like we are now, a session I'll put it as part of the playlist that just demonstrates how easy it is to get up and running and do virtually everything you wanna practice with Packet Tracer. All right, well, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna stop because I'll talk forever. I really enjoy uh, our time together in these, uh, in these live streams. And part of my strategy is that if I do the live streams, you get the real me. Um, and also there's a lot less editing to do. That means I can create more content and answer questions that come up about CCNA and, and create videos for it. And I can do it more frequently than if I was just creating content, editing it all to death, and then producing it. This way I'm doing two to three live streams a week and then putting them in playlists. So thank you very, very much for joining me for Router on a Stick. And if you, uh, if you really want to reinforce these concepts, I would encourage you to uh, watch the whole playlist and also use Packet Tracer or other gear in our practice environment and practice it. Because when you actually practice it and see it in action, then it helps reinforce it. And then when you need it, like you may be at a customer site and they may need to do some additional segregation of traffic and they don't have a lot of extra interfaces on their router. Maybe they have one or two. And so what you could do is you could carve it into VLANs do router on a stick as a temporary solution and have routing capability between all of VLANs and at the same time have some isolation. One of the benefits of isolating VLANs isn't just for size, it's also for control because we can use access control lists to control the traffic of what's allowed between human resources and engineering or sales and marketing. And we can put controls in place like a bodyguard who's standing between the VLANs on the router interfaces to control the traffic flows. All right, so I will see you in the next uh, session um, I'm targeting, not targeting, it's going to happen on uh, Saturday, which will be uh, subnetting Saturday. And that'll be 11 a.m. Pacific time. And I'll also add that to the playlist so you can find that at a later date if you need to as well. So I appreciate everybody who's in the queue, who's been answering questions, uh, Gus and Mike and others. I really, really appreciate all the support. I think that anybody who wants to get a CCNA it can do it. I think that anybody who wants to improve their career needs to start with the fundamentals and make sure they really know it. And all this information will carry it forward. So when you're working, let's say imagine five years and you think back, oh, I remember when I first started learning networking with Keith and we learned about ARP and VLANs and trunking and everything else. And in five years, you'll be working on software defined networks and you'll be working with automation and cloud services. But you know what? They're still using these technologies behind the scenes, many of them, to implement those cloud services and those advanced technologies. So behind the behind the scenes, all of this information is carryable, carryable. You can carry it forward, and it's important to know. 
And also, as you as you study something, I encourage you. I, I learned this the hard way. Back in uh, 1999, when I first started studying for Cisco, I was focused primarily on memorizing it to to know it, like not like to just pass the test. And then as I got to the CCNP level and the CCIE level, it occurred to me, wow, uh, you got to slow down here, Barker. It's like call myself. You need to slow down here. And you need to learn this because at the CCA level, they're not going to give you anything. <laughs> you need to know this so you can actually take those skills and actually, uh, in do, like like Bloom's theory of uh, Bloom's taxonomy of different levels of understanding and, and awareness and being able to apply and do uh, inductive reasoning about how things are working. So, as you start with your networking career, learn it to know it. Get that hands-on practice, and then just keep building. And it's rate ride your own ride. Just keep growing step by step by step by step. If you see other people way out in front, great, they're out in front because very likely they have been working at it for a long time. So don't get disappointed, don't be frustrated, just keep on getting better. And it'll be surprising to you if you just continue on studying and having fun doing it step by step, learning this, then that, then keep on moving and keep on practicing. I remember um, at Paramount Pictures, no, 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 no. Yeah, well, I'll leave off his name. So Paramount Pictures, like in 94, <laughs> Um, I led a team of technicians there and then like, like 10 years later, they, one of them reached out to me, uh, through my work, found me and, and said, Hey, what do I need to do to get my CCNA? And I thought, what have you been doing for 10 years? <laughs> Not in a negative way. I was like, it's pretty simple if you just start plugging at it. And I know that, you know, people have demands and life, you know, has family and everything else has demands, but it's totally worth it. It's totally worth it. So don't give up, stay the course and I'll see you in the next live stream. Until then, uh, again, I appreciate you being here. I'm gonna search for some exit music, and there it is. Bye-bye.